You're listening to 91 Reasons, a journey into the twisted landscape of pop culture. Keep your hands and arms inside the podcast at all times. And now, The Voice, Jeff Tucker. So, Gilly, big baseball fan? Kind of. Yeah? Dad bring you here a lot? Once a year on my birthday, then he pays an usher to watch me. Oh, I see. You have to understand, my father, in his own childhood, was without a positive male influence. Huh? His own father kicked him out when he was 15. So my dad was taught to see child raising as a job, a burden, a prison, rather than a playground. You understand what I'm saying? You don't talk like a kid. Yeah, well, I'm not really a kid. You're not a duck. This is a memory of when I was a kid. I'm 35 now. I have kids of my own. You don't really even exist. You're an amalgam. A what? A combination of several ushers my dad left me with over the years. Just combine them into one memory. Why? This was a great symbolic moment in my life. My father dumping me with you. It's why I swore things would be different with my kids. That's my dream. Strong, happy, confident kids. That's great. That's great. You know, you you got a lovely family and uh, I'm a goddamn amalgam. Gil? Who's that? That's my wife. Nice. Gil? Yeah? Game's over, honey. The St. Louis card wish to thank you for attending today's game. Please drive home safely and sober. Let's go. Well, here we are, folks. It's been couple of weeks i'm back with another episode sorry for the delay thanks for your patience uh uh if you're following anything you know that uh, knott's Berry farm kind of reopened they have this new taste of calico event where there are no rides there's a little bit of entertainment and a lot of food uh but that satisfies all of the guidelines that the governor the county the cdc all set down so we were open this last weekend and it was a it was a fantastic time. It just felt oh, it felt so good to be back and walking ghost town with people in it. I've walked it without people, and it really was a ghost town. But to be back in ghost town, people eating, having a good time, following all the rules, there was I, there was no issues over the weekend. Everybody that I talked to, where you just reminded, hey, can you put your mask on? They were like, yeah, no, I get it. I'm sorry, I had a lapse. You know, because a lot of people, most people are not like me. Uh, I've been going out the whole time. I put my mask on, I go out, I follow all the rules. Uh, I've never had any issues following rules I talked about on the last episode. But a lot of people didn't go out a lot during the shutdown. So... Going out is new and different, and they have to get back. It's you know like riding a bicycle, except this bicycle bicycle requires you to stay six feet away and to wear a mask and to do this and do that and do this and follow that and hand sanitize. I have so much hand sanitizer on my hand, you can see through it and see my bones. That's how often I sanitize my hands. My kids make fun of me if I walk by a hand sanitizer station. I have to get some. I have to, and when it's empty, I get I get disappointed. Like, oh, nobody refilled the sanitizing station, so I have to wait for the next one. Those used to be few and far between. You'd go into some restrooms where they'd have soap, and on the way out, hand sanitizer. And I lo- I've always been a big hand sanitizer guy, so this is no different for me. Uh, using hand sanitizer all day. I keep a bottle in the car because swap meets and thrift stores are not the most hygienic places, so I'm constantly sanitizing. So again, it's not much different. The world is just catching up to me and my weirdness. And now my weirdness is the normal. So the abnormal life that I've led now leads into normal. So I have to now leap beyond that 
to the new abnormal. You're always talking about the new normal. <laughs> F that. I almost said it. You can hear it. You almost said it. F the new normal. I'm looking for the new abnormal. What's the new abnormal? And that's how I live my weird life. How do you live yours? What are you doing that's weird? I love weird. My kids are always laughing because I am so surreal. Uh, we went to the swap meet this past weekend, and I got really lucky because I'm able to, my stupid talent is to just identify things, pick up on small little labels. I found a costume from a movie. There was a whole bunch of stuff from this production company. I guess they'd lost their storage, and I bought a stack of it because it wasn't very expensive. And there was a movie out in 2003 starring Adam Goldberg, not the one from The Goldberg Show, but Adam Goldberg. He was the guy in Saving Private Ryan who eventually gets stabbed by that enemy soldier. Uh, he's a good actor. He was in a movie called The Hebrew Hammer. Now, there's another movie called The Hebrew Hammer starring... Uh, um, What's his name? Uh, uh, I was gonna say Mr. Bertram, but uh, you know the guy Adam Carolla. But uh, no, this, and that's about a boxer. The the Hebrew Hammer I'm talking about is a Jewish superhero movie where he's like Shaft, except he's Jewish. The big joke of the movie is that he's a detective, so he's a uh, certified circumcised dick. You know, Dick meeting detective. Like, har, 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 that's the comedy. And, you know, whatever, no fault. It's, it's, it's some, here's what I told the kids. Somebody out there in the world, this is their favorite movie. This is their go-to. I'm watching the Hebrew Hammer again, man. Well, I got his costume. He wears a signature hat, this prayer scarf, and I got his hat, his prayer scarf, some of his shirts, even Rachel laughed, because some of the shirts are like the undershirts that he wore during filming, and his shoes. So it's a pretty complete uh, accessory set. I don't have the robe. I'm sure that was probably rented, but the hat is quite expensive, just based on the haberdashery that makes it. I looked up their hats, and they go for almost 200 bucks just for being a hat from that company, not just a hat that has also been in a movie, and is like, he's wearing it on the poster. So... I have that. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I'll end up selling it because what am I going to do with it? It's not anything I collect. I also got a wallet used in a movie starring William Hurt. And I know that because Josie had me. She goes, Dad, there's some guy's wallet here. So I picked it up and you could tell like, oh, this is William Hurt on the picture. It's not a, not a regular person. So this must be a movie prop. So I bought William Hurt's wallet from a movie from 2005 called The King. Now, the Hebrew Hammer and The King, since I now have props from both, I bought both those movies on eBay just to see, can I, because it's going to take a while to really watch them and freeze frame it to find screen grabs that show the actual props that I found. It's very time consuming. You have to screen match it. Screen matched means everything in the movie prop and wardrobe collecting world, which I, I have no desire to get into, not because I don't want to, but it's a very expensive hobby with even small objects going for big bucks. So not my cup of tea, but I'll certainly dip my toe in long enough to sell these items to some collector and make some Hebrew Hammer fan very happy because these are signature pieces from the film. They're, he wears them a lot, so that's pretty cool. And then Austin, in his infinite wisdom, looked at me and he just goes... How would you know that is a movie? Hebrew Hammer? I said, it's my job as a dork to know that. If I didn't know it, something is wrong. So I know it. That's because I never played sports. Uh, I never did anything exciting. I watched movies as a kid. Movies were my escape. I've talked about this on the show ad nauseum. I escaped into the movies. I escaped into Hill Valley. I escaped into Kingston Falls and Astor, or Astoria, Oregon from the Goonies and all these towns and places that you could fall into for a couple of hours and not wor worry about being beat up at school or not getting straight A's. I mean, these were real problems, folks. Real problems. And since... I love these movies so much. I was always looking through the movie. Like, I recognize that the movie is not real. I know that it's actors on a set 
doing a thing, and then they're edited together to do a cohesive story using techniques and trickery to tell you the story. I'm all fully aware of that. I was reading Starlog in sixth grade, or fifth grade even, uh, really young, reading Starlog and Fangoria and Cinefex and Cinefantastique. These are all expensive magazines that I would have to beg my mother to buy at the store. You know, Starlog, when I read it, was like $5 an issue. This is when a newspaper was 25 cents. So convincing your mother that, hey, Mad Magazine was great, and I collected my share of Mad Magazines. They were like two bucks. Starlog was five, and I just like slowly put that up at the groceries, hoping she didn't notice. But those magazines taught me that the movies that we love, the things that we love, are created by somebody. There are people behind the scenes who devote their lives to a certain brand of storytelling, whether that's directing, acting, special effects, set decorating, lighting, sound, wardrobe, props, model making, whatever it is. And I found myself, uh, when I saw Back to the Future, I saw Back to the Future opening night, 1985, uh, a door opened. Oh, this is about telling a story. Because up until that point, you you were you know dazzled by X wings flying through space and Tie fighters and the world the computer world of Tron. Welcome to the game grid and light cycles and zhu 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 and you know uh, the black hole which is really slow but has some really good effect shots and wow I'm being taken to another world another plane of existence and Back to the Future taught me that you could have an adventure right at home. You know, the Goonies were the same way. The Back to the Future told me in a more um, intricate way that the town you live in, the people you know, there's a story right there under the surface. You don't have to go anywhere to find the story. Marty McFly jumps in a car, drives 88 miles at the mall, and ends up at the same place he was, just at a different time. And that's all done through very minimal special effects. It was all done through the storytelling, just the scripts and the pages and everything making sense. And that's where, like, imagine sitting in the theater and everyone around you is enjoying the movie and you're just, you know that that um, pull focus where uh, Sheriff Brody's, uh, he sees the shark attack and the camera moves in but it pulls out at the same time and it's just that moment of euphoria I had that watching Back to the Future I can tell you exactly the moment it was it was when Marty's at the diner for the first time and Biff comes in and he says McFly what are you doing I told you never to come in here and Marty turns and that's his dad and there's that moment of just stark realization and it's in the way it's edited, the way it's shot, Michael J. Fox's reaction, and the printed page. Boom! Marty McFly is meeting, he's seeing his father at 17. That's a revelation. And that's where the movie clicks in. Oh, he's not just going back in time and seeing what life was like in 1955. He is seeing his parents as kids oh my god and all of the thing all of the revelations that come with that knowledge of oh my god my mother was once a teenager because you know i've talked about it again on this show kids are completely selfish it's one of the few um privileges of being a child is that you get to be infinitely selfish and nobody gets mad at you i want the candy now i'm gonna go trick-or-treat and eat all the candy right now i want dinner now i don't eat that i only eat this me 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 take me here take me there pick me up at practice take me to rehearsal pick me up all that right and then you you know there's a moment and it comes usually later in your 20s where you where like boom my parents were people and maybe They didn't have all the answers like I thought they did. Maybe they were just, gasp, winging it. And all of that just like like a funnel slammed into my head watching Back to the Future. It all poured in. Like, this is what you can do 
with paper and pen, you can write a story like this. And whether it gets made into a movie, a TV show, a cartoon, a play, or just a book or a short story or whatever, it becomes a thing. And you can transport people. You ever been sitting, reading a book, and the book is so good that you're so caught up in the story and you feel bad for all the people around you who are living their lives not knowing how great the story is. Like if you're reading a book at an airport, waiting for the plane to arrive. I know people just look at their phones now, but I used to buy books. You know, every airport has a book, had a, or had a bookstore where you could go in and buy a book for your flight. You know, I remember in 2001 buying Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Like, I heard this is good. I should, I should read this before that movie comes out and see if it's any good. And I read it on the plane. And you have that moment where you're in the book and you're inhabiting that world and no one else around you knows what's going on. I also had that with a book called um, The Golden Compass. Because The Golden Compass has... It's three books. And when you finally get to that third book and everybody's growing the hell up and literally going through puberty on the page in a way that you've never heard of because it has about it has to do with animals that are with you. And when the animal takes its final form, that's you going through puberty. It's all very complicated. But the two characters who are so desperately in love but realize that they cannot be together because being together rips the very fabric of the universe apart. And they, they can't be together. They have to go to their separate worlds. And they say, even though we're in separate worlds, there are certain things that are the same in our world. So I will sit on this bench at the same time you sit on your bench at Oxford and we'll be on the same bench at the same time. And I just, when I get to that moment, I just, I'm, I'm crying. And you look up and it's like, Nobody else is having this moment but me. And that's the power of the writer. And that's a long-winded way to sit down to talk about two writers that influenced pop culture in huge ways, but are rarely talked about. They're just names on a screen. And there are certain names, you know, through the years, you know, um, Stanley Kubrick, Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, James Cameron, Christopher Nolan, Quentin Tarantino, um, John Singleton, God rest his soul, really good directors that, that told these stories, but were also part of the stories themselves because they were always so front and center. These are the creators of these things. You know, I know that Raul Dahl wrote Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, you know, or ba- the book that it was based on, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I know that. Um, I grew up idolizing oddball writers. But these two writers sort of flew under the radar forever. They're just now making the rounds doing interviews where people are starting in their, in their golden years to now highlight all of the incredible touchstone work that they did for pop culture. But I just wanted to highlight them because, you know, these are the guys that made your childhood, whether you knew it or not. Because we all know Walt Disney and we all know Tim Burton, even though it was um, not Tim Burton who directed The Nightmare Before Christmas, but Henry Selleck, who also directed um, Coraline and James and the Giant Peach. And, you know, worked his butt off on all those stop-motion movies. Um, anywho, so these two guys, Lal Gans and Babalu Mandel. I remember going to the movies in the 80s and seeing their name on, a, on the screen a lot. But never really delving into it the way I did with, with people like Ivan Reitman and uh, Albert Brooks. You know, people who wrote this stuff that I idolized. But I idolized these two without ever really knowing how much they did for me. So I'm going to go through. I have these written down here. I have to print them out because it's a lot of material. Lal Gans and Babalu Mandel. They're 70 and 71. Uh, Lal Gans is 71. Babalu is 70. I mean, these are bizarre names. Lal Gans and Babalu Mandel. They're, they're just funny on their face, right? But these guys wrote funny, funny stuff. Uh, I'm going to start with Lau. Lau Gans uh, started writing for Happy Days. He wrote a lot of the Happy Days episodes. 
And anybody my age grew up really watching Happy Days. Happy Days was appointment television. Uh, I believe, you know, TV shows moved around a bit, but I'm pretty sure that Happy Days was on Tuesday nights on ABC. And it was one of those shows that you simply didn't miss because everybody at school was going to be talking about it the next day. Uh, Fonzie, Richie, Ralph Mouth, Potsy, Shortcake, Mr. and Mrs. C, and their adventures in Milwaukee in the 50s, a stylized cartoon version of the 50s. Uh, I have pictures of me on the first day of elementary school, 1976, and I am sitting there proudly with my metal Happy Days lunchbox. It was the first one I ever picked out on my own. Um, it's before Star Wars. After that, it was always Star Wars. After that, it, I have every lunchbox I had was Star Wars, and I have all of them except uh, there was an Empire Strikes Back plastic one that you put stickers on, and I got that one year because I wanted to put the stickers on, but of course it just disintegrated. But all the metal ones I still have, and uh, I treasure those. But I don't have the Happy Days one, funny enough. My mother must have donated it somewhere to the church rummage sale. But I was very into Happy Days. But as much as I was into Happy Days, uh, Lal Gans co-created what I consider to be the better show. And that is Laverne and Shirley. I have such a soft spot for Laverne and Shirley. And it's really hard to describe. Um, I liked Happy Days a lot. Watched it every week. But there was something about... Laverne and Shirley, that just, I don't know, they just felt like friends. I don't know if I would have been friends with Richie and Potsy, but I would have loved to have known Laverne and Shirley. Um, I, they're on MeTV right now, and I've been taping every single episode and enjoying them because they look better on MeTV than they ever have. Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley have both <clears throat> been fully restored and there's no, they're not fuzzy or faded. All the colors have been bumped up, and it's been sharpened. And you can see details you've never seen before. I mean, it's hard to describe to somebody who didn't grow up in the 70s how bloody awful the TVs were. Those big tube glass screen televisions with the bubble edge. And you turn it on, and it went boom. And you had to like, imagine warming up the TV. That was the thing, where your mother would go, hey, we're going to watch TV, go warm it up. And you'd go and flip, you know, pull the on switch, and it would go, and come to life. And it would take two or three minutes for the picture to finally come to its full brightness. And then when you turned it off, it would shrink to a dot in the middle, and that dot would stay there a while. Watching TV was bizarre. You had to get up to change the channel. There was only here in L.A., Two, four, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, twenty-eight, and fifty-six. Those were the channels we had. Uh, I remember. I've always wanted to talk about this on the show, but it didn't fit in any other episode. I remember going. Anybody ever go on vacation when you were a kid and just be bewildered by where the TV channels, the stations were on the dial? Like in LA, Channel Two was CBS, Channel Four was NBC. Channel 7 was ABC, but I would go to Tennessee and you try to watch Channel 7, excuse me, ABC, and it's like, oh, that's on Channel 42, and you go, 42? We don't even have 42 in California. And you'd click that thing, and the other thing was, like, it's weird even thinking about this. You would have to put the, you go, this is clicking, 2, 4, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, you... You, and then a second dial would go 17, 18, 20, 28, 42, and oh, 46, and here's channel, here's ABC on this, uh, bizarre, like totally bizarre. I try to explain this to my kids, they had no idea what I was even talking about. They just looked at me like I was crazy, which is partly true. So, I just loved watching Laverne and Shirley. Uh, when I snuck into Paramount, I saw a lot of amazing props. I saw the um, the baby buggy from the end of the Untouchables movie. I saw Maverick's helmet from Top Gun, which just recently went on the, is going on the auction block. Uh, I saw 
fighter jets from Top Gun. Uh, I saw the jukebox from the beginning of Happy Days. That's pretty cool. But the coolest thing I saw that day was Boo Boo Kitty, which is uh, Shirley Feeney's uh, stuffed cat on the Vernon Shirley. And I just remember staring at that thing like I would give anything to own Boo Boo Kitty because I just love Laverne, Laverne and Shirley, Lenny and Squiggy, Carmine, the big ragu. I watched every episode. Some of those episodes are so good. When they own that diner, my friend Felipe in high school, we used to sit around and go, Betty, please. Betty, please pick up your hash blacks. Betty, Betty, please. Like, and people would go, <clears throat> What are you doing? Are you stupid? We're like, it's from Laverne and Shirley. And they go, Laverne and Shirley? Yeah, Laverne and Shirley. Dork. Being a lifelong fan of Laverne and Shirley does not make you any friends. At the Orange Circle, somebody has a full-size vintage poster of Laverne and Shirley. And it's $35. And every time I go, I am so ready to pull the trigger and buy that poster. It's the coolest thing ever. I love. I mean, I love vintage posters, and the Vernon Shirley is the coolest. They made dolls of them, but they don't look that good. So I've never really been into collecting them. There's never been a really nice set of the Vernon Shirley dolls. There were Mego dolls that were 12 inch that were not good. I think there was a um, one of the 90s from this smaller company used to sell them in like round tubes. But uh, it's okay just to enjoy. And and Lau Gans co-created. Laverne and Shirley. Laverne and Shirley is filmed before a live studio audience. I mean, I loved all that. He also helped create Joni Loves Chachi, which Rachel swears by. She is such a Scott Bayo fan from Chachi and Charles in Charge. I love the guy from Zapped, but uh, that's another story. So, uh, Lau Gans wrote for TV. He wrote a lot of those episodes, created Laverne and Shirley with somebody else and Joni Loves Chachi. And then he moved on to movies. He moved on to movies and he, he wrote Night Shift, uh, which was Michael Keaton's first film. Uh, Ron Howard had already directed Grand Theft Auto for Roger Corman, but this was his first big studio picture. Um, Night Shift. Uh, it stars Henry Winkler, Michael Keaton, and Shelley Long. Uh, I, I love this movie. I didn't know Lau Gans wrote it. I mean, it makes sense now when you think about it. It's a high-concept movie. It's about a guy who works at the morgue, and he gets flipped to the night shift against his wishes, and he gets buddied up with Michael Keaton, who's this complete crazy guy, and... It's Henry Winkler playing against type because he had been cast as Fonzie for so long he wanted to do a part where he was like nebbish. So he plays this nebbish guy who is engaged to this woman who is never physical with him. She's a complete monster. So because his shift gets switched to the night, he starts to see this woman who lives across the way coming in at all hours. And it turns out Shelley Long is a prostitute. And she's a prostitute who hates her pimp. So Henry Winkler and Michael Keaton decide that they're going to steal all the girls and run an escort service at night using the hearse to drive people around. Because Keaton's already using the hearse as a limousine for proms. So it's an easy switch. And it's high concept. It's funny. It's a it's kind of movie they don't make anymore. A middle of the road comedy for adults. It's not for kids, but it's not gross. There's no gross out stuff in it. It's just situation comedy, and Michael Keaton shines in it. And Henry Winkler is great in it, playing against type. And I think I've seen Night Shift fifty times or more. I watched it a lot when I had it on um, Laserdisc. <laughs> so. Lal Gans gets the big break into movies. He jumps from TV to movies. And he hooks up with Babalu Mandel. And Mandel's a writer in his own right. But together, together, they write some of the best comedies of the decade. 80s and 90s. The two decades. So let's go through some of this. We, Night Shift, they wrote together. Fantastic movie. They go from Night Shift with Ron Howard to... Splash with Ron Howard. They get nominated for an Academy Award for writing Splash. Splash kicks off Touchstone Pictures. It ushers in a whole new era of 
Disney movies that are not quite just G-rated kid movies. They can tell a different kind of story, creates the touchstone label so that it's not a Disney film, and it gives great parts to John Candy and uh, Tom Hanks, Daryl Hannah, Eugene Levy. It's a great movie. You know, Splash just showed up on Disney Plus with, you know, they added the hair to cover up Daryl Hannah's butt in that shot. I have the DVD. I don't need to watch it on Disney Plus in some bizarro world. Okay, but it's a great movie. So they also write Spies Like Us. You ever seen Spies Like Us? Dan Aykroyd and Chevy Chase. It's where Dan Aykroyd met his wife on the on that film. Uh it's a fun comedy. It's not. It's not. It's not high art. It's not great, but it is a fun comedy. It's typical of the buddy comedies of the eighties. Uh, after that, they uh, wrote Gung Ho. Ron Howard directs Gung Ho with Michael Keaton and uh, a huge cast. It's about a small town auto factory being taken over by the Japanese. It's a culture clash, and they learn to work together. Uh, it's an underdog story. Uh, it's a really really solid movie with some really good moments about racial tensions and learning to be tolerant of other cultures. Uh, Not bad for a movie in 86, and it's a pretty darn good movie. Uh, Then they wrote The Money Pit. They were uncredited for writing The Money Pit, probably on purpose. Uh, The Money Pit uh, it's directed by um, Richard Benjamin, Tom Hanks, and Shelley Long by a house that implodes on itself the more they try to fix it the worse it gets uh the money pit i remember um seeing it in a theater at the dollar 50 theater uh i thought it was going to be like supernatural in some way or like there's a reason why the house is imploding but it's just one of those comedy of errors it's a it's a, it's a movie about being uncomfortable because it's just about bad things happening to people over and over again i'm not generally a fan of those movies uh the biggest example being like meet the parents where this nice guy is just beset upon at every turn because of these people that take everything the wrong way he's wrong on everything this is not like that this is the house itself as the villain mm, interesting uh, a, a modern day equivalent would probably be like uh, Mouse Trap. I mean, that's still twenty years ago, but uh, they don't make again. They don't make movies like this anymore. So then they wrote a small film called Vibes. Uh, probably nobody's ever even heard of Vibes. Uh, Vibes is uh, Jeff Goldblum and uh, Cindy Lauper playing psychics. Uh, this was a big video release when I worked at the video store. We must have had 10 copies of Vibes, and we were always being told to push Vibes on Friday nights. Hey, make sure they rent Vibes. Get Vibes out there. Like, okay, uh, it doesn't look very good. Now, as an adult, I think it looks kind of funny. I'm a real fan of these high-concept, again, high-concept, middle-of-the-road comedies. They don't cost a gazillion dollars to make. They're just about a couple of people in a circumstance. How do they get into it? How do they get out of it? Who do they fall in love with? Who do they meet? What lesson do they learn? You know, redemption, all that kind of thing. Again, movies they don't make anymore. It's like a broken record. Uh, and then in 1989, big movie, Parenthood. Uh, all-star cast, Ron Howard directs. Uh, Steve Martin, Mary Steenburgen, Rick Moranis, Tom Hulse, Jason Robards. I'm doing this all from memory because I'm a weirdo. Uh, I really loved Parenthood when it came out in theaters. Summer of 1989, uh, that's a busy summer, folks. Batman, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Lethal Weapon 2, Great Balls of Fire. Uh, a lot of movies came out in the summer of 89. And Parenthood h- held its own. It did pretty well being a comedy without special effects or explosions or superheroes. None of that. Really nice ensemble comedy. Keanu Reeves is in it. Diane Weist. Um... Martha Plimpton from The Goonies and Running on Empty. Uh, Solid, solid movie with a lot of really fun sequences. I really dig that movie. Uh, Even though I hemmed and hawed later in life, I have to admit that parenthood makes you want to be a parent. Because by the end of the movie, everybody ends up being a parent, a new parent in some way or so whether by adoption or, you know, 
last chance having a baby. Because when they finally reveal at the end who's having a baby, it's not who you think it is. And Steve Martin learns to not be so uptight, to go with the flow. The sequence about the guy in the tower probably wouldn't go over very well in today's culture, but this is a movie released in 89, so it gets away with stuff that wouldn't fly today. You can't look at the past with today's prism. It just doesn't work that way. Movies are in the context of the years, year they were made, the year they were released. You know, when you look at E.T. without the guns and with walkie-talkies, it looks silly. It looks sacrilegious. That's not the movie that Spielberg made. It's a, it's a do-over. It's a silly do-over. So, Parenthood. How about uh, we, after this we go to City Slickers? Uh, I saw City Slickers in the theater. Uh, at the time, I was a pretty big Billy Crystal fan. I watched all of Billy Crystal's movies. Uh, Running Scared. Throw Mama from the Train, When Harry Met Sally. Uh, City Slickers, about a guy going through a midlife crisis, Mitch, and going on a cattle drive with his friends, Daniel Stern and Bruno Kirby, to, as his wife says, find his smile again. Uh, it's a really fun movie. Again, it's a movie you don't see anymore. It's just guys going out. It's not dirty. It's not gross. There is a cattle birth scene, but that's not bad. And Jack Palace won an Oscar for playing Curly in it. Um, I saw City Slickers a lot. I mean, it's weird to say, like, I saw it a lot. You know, he goes, hello, hello. Uh, or um, if hate were people, I'd be China. Uh, that's Jake Gyllenhaal in his, I think, his first movie role as one of the son, one of the kids in the movie. Um it just it, these movies just make you feel good. Lal Gans and Babalu Mandel made movies that make you feel good. They reaffirm being alive, having an adventure, having kids, pushing yourself. Mitch in City Slickers is pushing himself. He's leaving the city to go be a cowboy, and he meets up with you know, with Jack Palance. Do you see that guy? His skin was so leathery. He looked like a saddlebag with eyes. The secret to life is one thing. Oh, yeah, what's that? you got to figure out what that is. Like, I watch City Slickers a lot. Helen Slater is in it. She looks amazing in this movie. It has the immortal line where he goes, Well, she's cute. Just go up and talk to her. What do I tell her? Tell her you, you want to wear her ass as a hat. I don't know what that means, but it sounds vaguely sexual. I just remember in the theater dropping my popcorn and having to pick it back up uh, because of that. And that's Laugans and Babalu Mandel writing that script. Great movie. Uh, and then we get to what I would consider the height of their game. Now, these, all, these other movies are great, and I've seen them a lot. But the next one on their list, I just I saw it. I've seen my wife. My wife my, I was watching it today with Rachel, a clip from it on YouTube. And Josie turned to me and said, you have an unhealthy fixation on that movie. And Rachel said, yeah, you don't, you don't even like baseball. And, of course, I'm talking about A League of Their Own. I don't know what it is. Uh, I talked about A League of Their Own on, um, on the video show that we do a couple of weeks ago. Because I do a little, sometimes I do a little video review. Uh there's something about League of Their Own. I, you know, I didn't see League of Their Own in the theater. At this time, I was really starting my adult life. And uh, like Puff the Magic Dragon, movies went away a little bit while I started dating Rachel. But I discovered this movie on VHS. I rented it. And I was blown away by it. And I've, I've owned it on VHS, Laserdisc, DVD, and now Blu-ray. Eventually, it'll just be a pill that I take so I can watch it. But I love A League of Their Own. I'd put it up there with Shawshank Redemption in that it's the it's a movie that when I see it, when I flip by it on TV, I have to stop and watch it because I have to get to the end scene of the museum. Uh, there's something magical about this movie, something magical about a period movie directed by Penny Marshall where it's about... Women playing baseball while the men are away at war, 
and they're keeping the country going by by keeping sports going. And it's their lives and their their trials and tribulations and the men are at war and are they, are they going to come home alive? Or are they going to come home at all? And Tom Hanks is getting redemption as Jimmy Dugan, the ball player who crapped out because of his drinking. It's not a love story. There's no love thread between Tom Hanks and Gina Davis. It's about sisters and rivalry. It's about family and doing the right thing when Gina Davis decides she's leaving because Kit wants it more. Dottie's going home because Kit wants it more. And Dottie knows if she stays that she will destroy Kit and Kit's spirit for the rest of her life. And Dottie can't do it. And at the end, Dottie gives it to her. And Kit may know it or not, but Kit's going to take it. And I just... I really love this movie. I love the end sequence of the museum where we catch up with them all later in life. And, you know, some are there and some have passed. And some are still alive, like the, the John Lovitz character, the, the, the scout is still alive. And little baby Stillwell is, the year gonna lose, he's still alive. And... For a long time, I didn't know how they did that in sequence because that's not Gina Davis, but it sounds like Gina Davis, but it's not Gina Davis in makeup, and they didn't have computers back then that could do that. And what it is is an actress with Gina Davis be, you know, looping in all her dialogue, and it makes perfect sense, but in the film, it's flawless. It's flawless. I think, now, 92, I believe, was the year that Unforgiven won. Uh, Unforgiven's a good movie, no doubt. It's much heavier. There's a lot more uh, dark theme going through Unforgiven than League of Their Own. But as far as longe- longevity, I would have given the Best Picture Oscar to A League of Their Own because it holds up today. It's timeless. I watch it a lot. I don't care for the Madonna song. I wish it had a better song with it. I prefer the song that they sing about being baseball players in their league. You know, I prefer that song. But I do love this movie. Um, Every time I talk about it, it makes me want to watch it again. So I'm going to move on here. So let's talk about... The next film was Mr. Saturday Night with Billy Crystal. Uh, this was a Billy Crystal pet project. Uh, I actually saw Mr. Saturday Night at one of those, hey, you want to see a sneak preview of a movie? We can't tell you what it is. And uh, we stayed after and gave our opinions and earned 10 bucks. Uh, not a very good movie. Uh, it's pretty dreary. It's about a cat skills comedian, his childhood to his rise to him in old age trying to get the magic back. I probably, if I watched it now, I'd probably enjoy it a lot more than I did back then. Uh, because I, just, I was too young for it. Some movies are just, you're just too young for. You have to grow the hell up to appreciate some movies. You know, as a kid, you're like, "Oh, this is terrible." And as an adult, you're like, "This is the best movie I've ever seen." I mean, how many times have I done that? So maybe I can do it, Mr. Saturday Night. Uh, after that, it was Greedy. You know, the two of them wrote Greedy. That's the ensemble picture with Michael J. Fox and um, uh, Kirk Douglas. Uh, Greedy's a weird movie. It does have a great performance by Phil Hartman. I'm partial to it, obviously, because it stars Michael J. Fox. But um, it's not a movie I would watch again and again. I've seen it a couple of times. Uh, The scene where he sings to him to try to impress him to be in the will is... It's hard to watch. It might flow better now because... You know, back in 1994 when Greedy was out, comedy was not the way it is now. The Office sort of ushered in an era of comedy about being uncomfortable, where the the laughs come from a character in a situation that they're made to feel uncomfortable. They say something awful, they do something awful, and everybody stares, and they have to figure a way out of it. The Michael Scott syndrome. Um, Greedy has a lot of that in it. Uh, It might have been ahead of its time. Again, I might watch it again and like it. Uh, City Slickers 2, The Legend of Curly's Gold. This is a cash grab movie. I saw it in a theater. It's not very good. Jack Palance plays Curly's brother. You know, it's stunt casting of 
I know that Curly died in the first film and it was touching, but this is Curly's brother played by the same guy. Uh, what's interesting about City Slickers 2, uh, if you know me at all, you know that I collect things. And you probably don't remember that City Slickers 2, The Legend of Curly's Gold, had collector's cups at Burger King. You could go to Burger King and get a large drink in a collector cup that had a lenticular sleeve that you could then wrap around the cup. And when you turn the sleeve, it gave the impression that the image on the cup was moving. I had the whole set of them. A movie I didn't particularly care about, and yet I was compelled to go to Burger King and buy all the glasses. They did the same thing with Last Action Hero, and those are probably more common, the Last Action Hero lenticular cups. Uh, moving on, Forget Paris. That's Billy Crystal and Deborah Winger, one of Deborah Winger's last big movies before she went into her own retirement. Um, Multiplicity. They wrote Multiplicity. That's the uh, Harold Ramis movie where Michael Keaton clones himself. Annie McDowell plays his wife. Uh, Annie McDowell returning with Harold Ramis from Groundhog Day. Multiplicity is not a bad movie. Uh, ahead of its time. Uh, the effects in it are pretty darn good because at, at certain points there are many Michael Keatons on the screen and they're all interacting and touching and handing each other items. Uh, that's a hard movie to find. I don't think I've ever seen it on DVD. If I did, I would pick it up because I think it's an oddity. It's a you know, multiplicity from 90, 96. That's a pretty expensive movie. That's, you know, the studio probably spent $100 million with advertising on Multiplicity. And for a company to spend that much money on a movie and not, and nobody remember it, like, that's weird, right? But that's the movies, man. Not every movie makes it to the $5 bin at uh, Walmart. Some of them just don't make it at all past their initial release. Uh, after that, they wrote Father's Day. Oh, Father's Day. Does anybody remember Father's Day? Father's Day is the, um, I believe it's Ivan Reitman, and it's um, Robin Williams and Billy Crystal on screen together for the first time in big roles, playing guys who are um, on the hunt for this teenage boy uh, because Julia Louise Dreyfus tells them that one of them is the father of the kid. So each one is racing to figure out who the father is. It's supposed to be funny. Sorry, guys. This is a clunker. Mr. Gans and Mr. Mandel, this is a clunker. Uh, I know uh, the writer would say, uh, Jeff, I got paid. And I understand that. I get it. Uh, I would love to be paid to write you know, whatever fee you got to write Father's Day. I would gladly trade places with you and write Father's Day. So I get that. Uh, after that, they did an uncredited polish on a big, massive hit, Liar, Liar. That is uh, Jim Carrey's big movie after, like, in summer 96. Think about this. In summer 94, excuse me, in the year of 94, Jim Carrey is the first actor to do three movies in a row in the same year. And that would be Ace Ventura, Best, Pet Detective, The Mask, and Dumb and Dumber that all make $100 million. No actor had ever done that in the history of the motion pictures. So, in 95, he turns up as the Riddler in a high-profile Batman movie. And then in 96, summer of 96, Jim Carrey is paid $20 million to be the lead in The Cable Guy. Ben Stiller directing, Judd Apatow writing, Total Bomb. Blacker than night comedy that nobody gets except me. I love Cable Guy. I was the only guy in the theater laughing. I must have sounded like Robert De Niro in Cape Fear laughing at Problem Child. You know, just oh, <laughs> because I thought Cable Guy was great. Now, nobody else did. So Jim Carrey's star started to dim. And then in early 97, I think spring, boom, liar, liar. It's a huge return to form. It makes Jim Carrey into bigger than a superstar. You know, a stratosphere-level star. 
20 mil a picture every picture after that for a while because of the strength of Liar Liar. Liar Liar is a great movie. It's very funny. Um, I've seen it a, a, a few dozen times. I think it's very well done. Uh, I love the woman who plays his secretary. She's also the caseworker in Mrs. Doubtfire. She's a great actress. So Liar Liar, after that, they write Ed TV. Does anyone remember Ed TV? Ed TV is the um, movie where they're following Matthew McConaughey around with a camera. It predates reality television. At, in 97, the only reality television we have is MTV's The Real World. So this was groundbreaking. And so they would have, uh, excuse me, Ed TV in 99. Uh, at the same time, nearly, that The Truman Show came out. So two movies were coming out basically with the same premise. One is, let's just follow a guy with a camera. The other is, the guy doesn't know he's being followed with a camera. I was a bigger fan of The Truman Show. Uh, Peter Ware directed a very melancholy um, thesis on what it means to be human. You know, I think you could watch The Truman Show next to Clockwork Orange and have the same sort of discussion about what makes a human human. Ed TV's more of this romp of if you suddenly became the biggest TV movie star in the world, what would you do? You know? Not a bad movie. Just got overshadowed. That's a Ron Howard movie as well. Uh, Where the Heart Is, I think that's the one with Natalie Portman. And then Fever Pitch with... Um, Jimmy Fallon and Drew Barrymore about Boston winning the World Series the same year they won the World Series or around the same time. And then uh, Robots, the cartoon movie, Tooth Fairy with The Rock, and then it ends pretty much with Parental Guidance. And that's the Billy Crystal movie with... Um, oh gosh, what's her name? I thought you just blanked on her name. Uh, Ruthless People... Uh, Beaches, uh, oh my god, I'm going to kill myself. Bette Midler, god, I'm so stupid. It's been a long night, folks. It's uh, it's 11.15. Uh, I actually saw Parental Guidance in the theater because in 2012, uh, they were just starting to lose regular movies. And every movie was going to be a superhero. And I said, we have to go see a movie like this, Rachel, to promote that it's going to be something that people will go support. We also went and saw a Book Club, which is not... You know, by the same guys, but it's the same kind of adult, middle of the road comedy, uh, and that's the Babalu Mandel and Lau Gans filmography. When you go to Babalu Mandel, he also wrote some stuff on his own. Uh, let's see, he wrote an episode of, of Amazing Stories called Boo, that was directed by Joe Dante. It's about two ghosts who are happy with their ghostly lives until their house gets bought by porn stars. Uh, Robert Picardo is in it. Love Robert Picardo. Well, of course, if Joe Dante directed it, Robert Picardo's going to be in it. But they're trying to get them out of their house. It's the same plot as Beetlejuice, even down to the neon and tacky decor. Uh, but it is an episode of Amazing Story. I could do a whole hour and a half on Amazing Stories, because I watched every episode. It, it was, again, appointment television. So, uh, Babalu wrote that, and uh, other than the stuff he did with Lau Gans, the biggest thing Babalu wrote was uh, the Flintstones movie in 1994, uh, for which he won the Razzie Award for Worst Screenplay of the Year, which I think is pretty funny. Uh, I remember going to see the Flintstones opening night, and just like, I love Rick Moranis. I'm a fan of John Goodman. But that movie's a mess. Uh, mostly practical, so it's pretty interesting to watch if you haven't seen it. You know, they really did build Bedrock out in the desert and make a movie on it, you know. They made such a big deal about <clears throat> just, you know, six or seven years later building Whoville for the Grinch at Universal Studios and leaving it up. They really should have just left Bedrock up at uh, Universal and made it a tourist attraction, but say la vie. There's that, uh, you could have gone to that uh, Bedrock Flintstones RV park out in the desert, but that recently closed too. Uh, of course, having written all these great movies, it was inevitable that they would make TV shows out of some of them. So they did make a short-lived TV show out of Gung Ho. 
Uh, they did a 1990 TV show of Parenthood. They also did the 2010 version of Parenthood that, that went on a lot longer that Rachel was a big fan of. And oddly enough, they did a TV show of League of Their Own, which I just tried to watch, but it's actually unwatchable because they made a sitcom out of a League of Their Own. So it starts with some on-location baseball play and then cuts to sets with the three three camera sitcom setup, so it and and, a, and a, either a laugh track or a live audience. I'm sure it's just a laugh track, but you know, hey, again, as uh, these guys would tell me if they were here, we got paid, Jeff, and I go, ain't nothing wrong with that, guys. So this episode will serve as a thank you to Lal Gans and Babalu Mandel for. All the amazing work you guys put out and all the hard work that you did um, making these movies that, for a lonely, dorky kid like me, these were my friends. These movies, these characters, these locations, you know, almost Walter Mitty where I could just daydream about being in that world and wanting to escape the awful stepdad world I was in and that goes for both the drunks in the early 80s and Berg in the later 80s that both made my life in that decade a living hell Uh, but movies like this and guys like this they're funny their wit they got at me through it and there's something about that you know there's something about the human condition that we can escape through story and it's weird to think in this shutdown that they were telling me what's essential and what's not. And somehow my job as a writer was not essential. And I say, sir, I think you're wrong. Because there's always a need for good stories. There's always a need for escape. And that need is most important in times like this where escape is what we need. And not physical escape, not breaking the rules, but escaping into the interior of ourselves through comedy and drama and characters and stories and folklore. And ever since somebody sat around the campfire and told the story of the mastodon that got away, that's what we've been wired for. That's the opening. Go watch the opening of Amazing Stories from 1985. Uh, It chronicles storytelling from cave paintings and fire all the way to digital technology of computer graphics. And even as a 14-year-old kid watching that show, I got the references. Like, this is storytelling, books, and movies, and words. And thank you, Lao Gans and Babalu Mandel, for your words. This has been fun, guys. I've wanted to do this episode a long time. I finally sat down and did all the legwork on what those guys were uh, responsible for. I would be remiss if I didn't say that the scene at the beginning of Parenthood where the guy, the, the ballpark vendor says, well, that's great, you've got a wife and kids, and I'm a goddamn amalgam. That's Lal Gans. That's him in the movie. And I didn't know that until today. And so you're never too old to learn something new about a movie that you love. And... I love all those movies. And you'll excuse me, but I have to go watch A League of Their Own again. (laughs) Hey, guys. Stay sane. Put your mask on. Uh, I know I wouldn't say put your mask on, but I put my mask on. So, you know, it's the least we can do for our fellow man and woman and whatever, right? (laughs) I'm getting punch drunk, but I'm I'm at the end here. Uh, I'm Jeff Tucker, and I hope to one day be the writer that Lal Gans and Babalu Mandel are. Damn, what a filmography. And this is, or was, and will continue to be, 91 Reasons. Thanks for listening to 91 Reasons. Please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. Find us on Facebook. Is anyone even still listening? That's great. That's great. You know, you you got a lovely family, and uh, I'm a goddamn amalgam. <laughs>